has it been, it's just now been a little over 24 hours since we heard the news of Mr. B's passing. And so many young people have come out and expressed not only condolences, but respect and admiration, including figures who people listen to who are mass media figures. And you think to yourself, okay, if you got that kind of respect for Harry Belafonte, you're going to have to do more than just say that, you know, you celebrate his life. You're going to have to walk in his footsteps. And Mr. Mr. Belafonte, yeah, at a meeting of elders sometime back, he's sitting in the room. He said, now I'm in here with all these elders and all this combined wisdom, but I don't see many young people. Let me get out here and redouble my efforts. And he spent what the last, well, I won't say the last half, but certainly the last third of his life, mostly with young people. And he poured into them because, you know, his thing is, you know, you're not going to say it the way I would say it, but it's my obligation to pour into you what I've experienced so that when you do say something and, and that people are going to listen to, you'll be informed. And so we can't stop. You know, a lot of the, a lot of young ears are tuned in right now to you. So you say, I hear I see young people in the streets all the time and I hear them and, you know, they're, they're listening. Their parents are listening. They're listening through their parents. And so, you know, all we can do is Henry Highland Garnett said is speak and leave the rest to God. I, I spent some time after I found out yesterday <clears throat> that Harry Belafonte made transition because I, I know him through Jossie, uh, Big Indian, uh, Big Indian Ross. I know him through to Siri X. I know him through people who he has, you know, empowered in, in the last 10 years to get out in the streets because he was still the elder that many of us need to aspire to be. I always say be elder worthy just because you're old doesn't make you an elder. Be el Harry Belafonte was an elder because he had people sit at his feet and he, he poured into them the knowledge. But I'm watching the sit in uh, produced by Joy Ann Reed, uh with a lot of amazing voices on there. And uh, it's the night. And, and this is how you, you, you take a thin slice of somebody's moment. It's the night, the week that Harry Belafonte hosted the Tonight Show. But in that week, they were able to pull in all of the things with the civil rights movement, his work with how Martin Luther King even came. Martin Luther King reached out to him and he realized in that moment that he needed more people to help do what he was doing. He brought in Stokely, Car Stokely Carmichael, who didn't agree with Martin Luther King, to have them come together around the poor people's movement. Th this man was so instrumental to a lot of things. We were sitting, planning strategy for the Poor People's Campaign, which was on the horizon of the politics of the day. That's why he went to Memphis. And in the course of that meeting, he seemed distracted and a little under-focused. Under and when we asked him what was the matter, Martin said, you know, I've been thinking long and hard about our struggle. We worked tenaciously for our rights. And uh, the culmination of all that effort will be reflected in what we've come to call the integration movement. And I sit here deeply concerned that I suspect we are leading our nation on an integration trip that has us integrating into a burning house. I don't think we quite understood how pathetic that remark was. After all, we're in the midst of a very heady moment in our struggle. We were winning on a lot of frontiers. Bull Connor had been confronted. The bus boycotts had worked. Votes were coming. Uh, even Lyndon Baines Johnson had been uh, Stuck by the spirit and got up and talked about we shall overcome in the Congress. And uh, for Dr. King to have been in this place at the time when we seemed to be making great headway was a moment to pause and reflect. That reflection has taken longer than I had suspected it would, but it has certainly come to reveal itself fully when we look the condition in which we find not only our world, but in particular, our nation. Mm. That was the unmistakable voice of Harry Belafonte, who made transition yesterday. Um, two-time, people know him, two-time Grammy winner, 11-time career nominee. Of course, we know him from his music. I love this sit-in where they talked about the folk songs 
that he transitioned into uh, folk songs. Best performance he won for folk, uh, Swing That Hammer. Uh, of course, he won an Oscar uh, uh, for his body of work. One of those, you know, Oscars that they give people for body of work when they know honorary um, <laughs> that he probably deserves so much more. Uh, Tony Award he got in 1954 uh, and an Emmy for... Belafonte's uh, Tonight Show uh, appearance for that one week, his special Tonight with Belafonte won an Emmy in 1960. No, this was something else he was on TV for. Okay, so he's been doing a lot of things. We are here with uh, Dr. Greg Carr, uh, who will be going into a little more depth on Saturday in class with Carr. Those of you in Nubia, you know what that is. It'll be live there, and eventually it'll make its way over to YouTube. Dr. Carr is here. Dr. Greg Carr, Africana Carr, America's teacher. Hi. Hello, Prof. I, I uh, so funny. I saw some. Anyway, I won't get into that. I love the fact that you know we're we're able to do this. Um, can you believe it? It's only been a handful of years, and uh, our sister Ajua, she's an April baby. She's not left fortunate enough to be a Taurus, but she's born on the nineteenth uh, of that. Habit. Very cool. One more day in the cooker. She'd have been. One more yes. day in the cooker. She'd have been. <laughs> all right but that's okay oh my goodness yes yeah, it's, it's mr b man that's uh listen to you talk about that clip integrating into a burning building thinking about integration you know harry belafonte is so complicated i mean there are folks that well, you know if he was so pro-black how come he married a white woman and it's like yeah well a couple of things it, actually that was his second wife uh, and she was the only white dancer in the Catherine Dunham troupe. It's like, okay. But his first wife, Marguerite, you know, what, three years now we've been having these weekly conversations. How does this always end up coming back to Dunbar High School? Marguerite was a graduate of Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, Harry Belfonte's first wife. <laughs> she went to she went to Hampton. She's the one putting black books in his hands, as well as the brothers in the Navy when he was in the Navy. Readers, what you were talking about before the break, readers. Just, you know, reading Belafonte. And when they would not rent to them on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, uh, they leased a, an apartment, uh, uh, he, and his, he and his second wife. I think Julie is in there, Julie Belafonte. Um, yeah. yeah Julie. Yep. Julie Robinson Bel Belafonte. Yep. And and uh, Margarita is Sherry Belafonte's uh, mom. We know Sherry Belafonte. But those of us growing up in a certain era, you know, we know her that's exactly, uh, actress. That's, um, exactly. that's her mama. That's exactly right. No question. So so when 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 um they were divorced and then he married Julie and they couldn't find a place on the upper east side of Manhattan, because we know, of course, all racism is not only in the south in the United States. They went to the west side and uh, rented a place, leased a place until the landlord found out that, wait a minute, they're not. Wait, he's a black dude. So you got to go. Now, crazy is the landlord, Ramphis Trujillo. He was the guy who was a jet setting playboy son of the dictator of the Dominican Republic that the United States propped up for years. Rafael Trio found out he was, oh, you black, you got to go. So what did Belafonte do? Put a put a corporation together with three friends under a name, bought the building. He took the fifth floor for himself and then leased out co-ops to his friends, including Lena Horn, and integrated that building. At 21 rooms. It's, Professor Hunter, help me because I have no point of reference for this. Is it an apartment when you have 21 rooms on the fifth floor of 300 West End Avenue? <laughs> no, sure. that, that is uh, a castle Come in the on. sky. It's a deluxe apartment D -Lux. in the sky. D -Lux. D -Lux. <laughs> and then, of course, that became the headquarters for the Civil Rights Movement. This is Harry Belafonte, Cindy Poitier, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee, he had everybody from John Kennedy to Martin Luther King to Robert Kennedy, Larry Hansberry, you name it. They raising straight money for the Civil Rights Movement, keeping Dr. King out of jail, propping up SNCC, pumping money to get people's bail money out of them 21 rooms at 300 West End Avenue. I mean, it, it's got to be a cinematic story. I mean, sure, we have a documentary where Mr. B is talking, but my goodness, it doesn't even seem real. In 96 years, yeah, we, 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 I think both of us would take that right now. What do you do with people? Because I, Jesus, I could talk with you all day. Um, who are fixated by the marriage choices because you know Sidney Poitier's second wife was white Julie was his second wife and then he married a third wife who was white um and Julie to me didn't look white 
Um, she looked like an other. She was she had melanin. Uh, oh, she's Jewish. So as was Fonte's father, who was from Martinique, his father's father was Jewish. Right. Sometimes you bring that up to throw people off. <laughs> Because because here's the distraction, right? We're focused on melanin and origin, and while these more multinational capitalist power structures don't give it, it's all fodder for them. Keep fighting, keep fighting over lineage and complexions, and keep please keep doing that while we get my get your hands out my pocket. No, they're gonna keep their hands in your pocket, virtually, physically, in all manner. <laughs> Right. While we are tossing out babies with the bathwater. So you, you're not rocking with Belafonte because he married. Away. Like we have that going on right now, Dr. Carr. It's so crazy to me. And it's, it's going to be there. It's going to be there. I mean, it's funny because as you said, we, we talked about Harry Belafonte and we did a great deal of that conversation in the context, of course, of his very good friend, who we often refer to as his best friend, Sidney Poitier. And, uh, and when you mentioned the fact that, you know, he, hosted that week in February 1968 on the Tonight Show, we know that that was the white-facing platform that allowed him to give the rest of the country a taste of what went on in Black talk circles. Uh, we think about the man they call Mr. Soul, Ellis Hazlett. You see Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte sitting there on this talk show out of New York with Ellis Hazlett talking about civil rights. And when Juanita, as we talked about, when we talked about Mr. Poitier, when uh, Sidney Port uh, Poitier's first wife, when they had a divorce, Belafonte helped him through it. It was a very painful divorce. And we talked about that. But the interesting thing was we see them together, but there was conflict between two of them. And ironically, it was largely around the movies. Harry Belafonte, shrewd businessman, had bought the rights uh, to, to serve with love. But but City Poitier ends up playing that role. And of course, that in Lilies of the Field and in the Heat of the Night, he becomes the movie star. Harry Belafonte did not make a film in the 1960s, in part because with the spirit of Paul Robeson in his ear, he said, these roles are not the kind of roles I want to represent Black people in and be Black men. Now, he adjusted that. He came back in the 70s. And of course, him and Poitier together, uh, we got to talk about Geechee Dan Buford. I mean, <laughs> the guy he's in, in, a, in a Uptown Saturday Night, you know, but but the reality was there were tensions between Poitier and Belafonte on what kind of role should we take to represent the race? Now, of course, that those tensions did not destroy the friendship. And of course, they, they, they remained friends. They were best friends. And of course, you know, Poitier talking Belafonte into, and here they go riding through the South with thousands of dollars in, in cash money in a bag running in front of the, 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 the white racist. And he said, look, man, I ain't riding down here with you no more. What's wrong with you, man? But but the point I'm trying to make is that this obsession with race was not something that either of them allowed to frame the way they intervene on behalf of our common humanity. And they never did it in a way that compromised their existence as black men or in coalition with everybody from Eartha Kitt to Josephine Baker as black women. They, they they never apologized for or tried to make excuses for the fact they were black. They were incredibly proud of that. At the same time, they didn't express that pride in a way that uh, that prevented others from supporting the movement. And those others were critical. I, I was um, when watching the sit in um, and Harry Belafonte sitting at that desk and everyone from Aretha Franklin to Dion, Dion Warwick to Frida Payne to I mean. I mean, it was amazing. Of course, Lena Horne, Martin Luther King is on the same day as Frida Payne. And the, the lineup, the fact that he could assemble, these were phone calls that he made, right? And I think about the legacy when we talk about a life lived. It is who you impacted. It is the what you left behind, you know, in terms of what people could be nourished by. And this man's life is a study of that. And, as, and I brought up Jasiri X because this is recent, you know, and as, as early as this year, he was in community with these organizers in Pittsburgh, giving them some blueprints for how to, to get it done. And that's what this life should be about, you know, not who you slept with or who likes you, or who don't like you, but like, what are you doing? 